So, this is Phil Eklund and uh, the new game, Pax Emancipation. Yeah, the first uh, one of the games in the Pax series of games. And I am doing market. Pax games are rather unique in being um, a blend, a uh, well integrated. Um, a good integration between military and political and economic factors. And Pax Emancipation no, is no exception to this, but I would say it's the most ambitious of the Pax series um, so far. There was Pax Corpuriana, Pax Pamir, Pax Renaissance. And Pax Renaissance. And this sort of, since this takes place in the uh, Enlightenment, this is sort of a successor to Pax Renaissance. But um, it's a lot more ambitious for several reasons. One of them is that uh, now it encompasses the whole world. Um, Pax Renaissance was only the Mediterranean world, and that was. <laughs> That was uh, a big enough sweep all in of itself, but um, here we have um, uh, the 13 colonies, Europe, Ottoman Empire, China, Japan, Brazil, Congo, Zululand, India, and East Indies. So this is the whole world as it was around the 18th century when the game starts. Um, another reason why it's very ambitious is because it's a uh, cooperative game. Or it can be, there's several... Yeah, it's a cooperative, um, I guess it's always cooperative, but it can also be competitive. There's actually what I call the Methusian a game which is pure competitive yeah, okay. so competitive so. from and there's a solitaire version there's a late version it starts in 1865 um, the end of the American Civil War and it's assumed that all the Western world is modern and only the Eastern world is still feudalistic and um, has to be liberated uh, but the standard game starts in 1776, and uh, at this time, America was on the threshold of its own revolution. I'll do a little bit of setup on the map here. Uh, the game is set up. Uh, maybe you should tell something about the various. It's almost set up here. It's just a little extra. Yeah. Little yeah. Set. Uh, another another reason that Pax Emancipation is such a challenge is that there's five arenas of play. You have not only the map, and we'll have workers and agents and slaves placed on the map, which I'll do in a moment, uh, but you also have the um, finance boards. Each of the three players in the game, up to three players, uh, has their own finance board, which they uh, maneuver their agents to see just um, how far in debt they are. The market is a traditional PAX feature from which uh, cards are, are acquired. And in the advanced game, at least, there is the splay. Now, the splay, unlike in a lot of games, unlike in previous PAX games, which is a private affair, you build your own splay, uh, because the goal here is universal abolition of slaves, um, progress towards this in various sorts of freedoms and the like is global. And so these splays are built by the various players, but they affect everyone. And so, um, especially in the cooperative version, you can see the global progress. So there's uh, five arenas. The display is only an advanced game, however. And um, the advanced game also has the additional features that you can do, legislation, 
revolutions are feature only in the advanced game, um, like uh, the U.S. Civil War or the American Revolution. Well, all the areas um, have the possibility of a revolution from the medieval state to the modern state. And um, the, that's only an advanced game. Literacy, well, very important in the modernization of the world is the world has become literate. And not only a few tiny minority of elites uh, or monks, uh, scribes sitting in a library can be literate. You have to have a significant proportion of the population to be literate for ideas such as abolitionism to take hold. And, um, of course, slave owners were against, well, often they were against um, slaves becoming literate. The lawsuits, yeah, yeah, for obvious reasons, although there were um, very religious slavers who wanted their, wanted their um, wards to become one with the Word of God and, and read the Bible. And... Uh, but uh, their neighbors might not appreciate this sort of education that was going on. And that's part of the game as well, especially in the literacy part. Lawsuits, plebiscites, uh, these are also advanced game things. So I won't be talking to, and mosquitoes. I should mention the mosquitoes are um, a part only of the advanced game. And they're significant in as much as um, they prohibited European colonization of mosquito-infested areas. The indigenous people were long accustomed to mosquitoes. This is sort of the reverse uh, situation from when the New World was colonized and the inhabitants were vulnerable to all sorts of diseases the invaders brought in Africa and in New Guinea. Um, the mosquitoes uh, were against the invading um, Europeans. So, uh, but that's only uh, these little green discs here, um, only in the advanced game, and um, they show things that are off limits and tell certain aspects of the um, of the industrial revolution um, have been. Uh, fulfilled that you can actually get rid of the mosquitoes, drain the swamps, and the like. And the last, okay, go ahead. And uh, well, there are two rule books, and in this one you have advanced game rules. Yes. So uh, they're clearly separated, and uh, when you played it unadvanced once or a couple of times with these rules, you can uh, find all the details for for advanced game there. Right. One more thing, I don't want to take too much time on the advanced game, is factory cubes. Um, factories are something that you can build only in an advanced game. Okay, so uh, what would you like to know first? Well, maybe complete the setup. Oh, that's right, I was going to complete the setup. Um, we have agents here. Kareem designed these little pawns to look like Mm, I don't know, little figures, I suppose, uh, when yeah, looked at from this with side. Hat, I'd say. With a hat. And agents are the basic unit of play. And we'll start with a um, British agent. Red is the British player, or at least a parliamentarian player um, in the game. And there's the red dot there. Oh, there's a red dot mm. that shows me that America or the 13 colonies is starting as a British colony and um, England itself starts as a British colony, uh, so to speak. And we have meeples as well as agents. We have little shaped laser cut figures and these represent the populace which can be enslaved or free and um, they can be of different um, ideologies. Uh, if they're parliamentarian ideology, they're red. Um, green is a philanthropist, and we'll start with some philanthropist in liberated France. And white is the evangelicals, 
and um, we'll start with one of those in France as well. And and those were placed on squares. Yeah, there were dots for the rock for the figures and squares to mark where where. Yeah, the, they match the footprint of the base of the figure. The pawns yeah. or agents are round. And I can see Brazil has a white dot here um, because it starts Jesuit controlled. If you saw the movie The Mission, I think that's a Scorsese film. Scorsese. Scorsese, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, that um, covers this period of the uh, Jesuits fighting um, against slavery. And then you more corn and made a music, I think. Oh, yeah? I think. Okay. And um, this green one, the philanthropist or the private firms, this will represent John Company or um, the British East India Company in India uh, in its uh, private phase. And we even have an elephant. This elephant was stolen or borrowed from Pax Pamir. It'll start pointing in London here. And this just shows where the media focus is, where, um, where this is the era of um, when newspapers were, in, in the Western world at least, were widely um, decimated and journalism was getting its start. So journalistic attention is shown by the elephant, which can travel around. And that's the focus of uh, emancipation activities because if I have to do Oh, there's a, um, the game also has blood products. These are both human trafficking and trafficking and things such as, well, this is cotton, King Cotton, but there's also things like, um, uh, coffee and tea, opium, and uh, other things that was either produced by slaves or traffic in slaves themselves. So it's the goal of the players, if I haven't mentioned it, it's the goal of the players to accomplish perhaps the most difficult and ambitious goal in human history. This is the vanquishing or the illegalization of slavery throughout the entire world. Um, it's hard to even describe now that we're used to human rights and the fact that um, the dignity of individuals and that, oh, you have a right to a trial, you have a right to free speech, you have, you can, um, you just can't um, throw someone chains and have them work for you, that's frowned upon. But uh, when the game starts, this was the norm. This was the absolute norm. And it had been the norm for centuries, millennia. That's, that's, ever since um, people first started getting together in groups, um, a stronger group would go enslave a weaker group that was next door. And not only was nothing immoral about this, Every religion in the world had long accommodated slavery, uh, long said that um, servants should obey their masters, that um, if you were born into an untouchable caste or whatever, that this was the way of the world, as cruel and as unpleasant as it was. And there was a very good reason for all this. The unquestioned, unspoken premise of this was if you want to build pyramids, you had, you had to enslave people. For civilization to work, you had to have slaves, someone to do the dirty work. How would it work otherwise? Um, if you wanted to have any touch of, of civilized living or, or food on the table, not just civilized living, someone's got to toil in the fields to, to do this. It was absolutely unquestioned that without slavery, um, all of civilization would collapse, just like that. No one, even the slaves themselves did not question this. Throughout, uh, like the Zanj Rebellion in Africa or, or the Israelites in, in Israel, um, even if they were successful in 
freeing themselves. They didn't question the basic morality of slavery. They just turned around and started enslaving others and um, saying, well, slavery is necessary. I'm just so glad I'm not a slave anymore. Mm -hmm. um, that happened also in Haiti, the, the uh, more modern revo slave revolution, which was successful in Haiti, um, but did not, unfortunately, get rid of slavery. It just changed the masters around a bit. So the um, goal here, first of all, there's no idea that has any chance of success if it's not conceived. So someone had to come up with the idea that maybe a civilization could work without slaves, and maybe it was a good idea to try it. And this game is attempting to show this very um, novel idea and how it came around and how um, to even say, well, maybe we should uh, get rid of, make slavery illegal in the parts where it had been long obsolete, which is only in Western Europe, only in France and England, and a couple of small colonies in the future United States of America, like Vermont, um, didn't have any slaves anymore, and uh, because, not because of special legislation, but just because they were obsolete. Um, they, they found that um, people were more productive when they weren't being whipped and things like this, and uh, actually had a choice of uh, careers and things like this that it seemed to... Family and their own house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to work for it. And yeah, yeah. It's, you know, Profit mode of being able to keep what you earn, what you work for, things like this. These were radical ideas, but even then, no one conceived um, of trying to extend this to places where it was entrenched. Um, and even the most idealistic um, dreamer could not have imagined that... Um, even with the might of the British Empire, their ships and guns, that they could actually, within just a few generations, have, a, to a large part, um, illegalized slavery. It's still held on in pockets far from civilization, even to um, even, even to just a, yeah, even even today. Today, um, every country in the world has illegalized slavery, um, and. Um, but still, it's practiced with a wink and a nod in, in places, but it's, I still don't want to diminish uh, no, the, the, the historic significance that in theory, at least, if a slave could, if they got access to a telephone or to a cell phone or something, call the police and, and, and have the perp arrested for this crime against humanity. But um, this was not an easy struggle, and um, the cards all um, depict heroes in this struggle. There's, I don't have take that um, cards here. Every one of these guys is a hero of some sort or another. There are different brands of freedom, different ideas along abolitionism, different means. Should it be a revolt? Should the slaves revolt and overthrow the masters, or should it be done legally, um, uh, legislate its, um, their way? Should they be, uh, slave owners be paid off um, through manumission or something? Uh, there are different ideas. Or should you fight a civil war and, and kill off millions and millions of your own populace over this? Uh, this is another option. Not tested a very by some. <laughs> tested by some, uh, but um, so uh, uh, that's a, I've given a lot of time to the background. I'll just go over the game. Uh, hopefully, not so wordy here. You start. Um, I'll describe a few things about the finance board. Uh, you have uh, this was developed by my son, actually, game designer Matt Eklund. 
um, for his game Pax Transhumanity. Which so um, the finance board, um, as developed by Matt, is uh, a means of showing how much capital, wealth, and debt you have. And so you maneuver agents on this board. Uh, each downward movement generates wealth for expensive actions. You can also install these agents onto the map. Um, you can also install them as syndication agents. If you want to, for instance, um, oh, around civil society, here's a particular card. This is um, Torqueville. He's a French um, philosopher and political observer, especially of America, um, and um, democratic theorist. And if you want to syndicate this idea, um, then you would install such a thing from your finances into there. That means you formed a group. This will give you abilities. Um, any syndication on here will give you abilities as shown by the icons in the rightmost column. In this case, we are talking about westernized and plebiscite abilities. Um, but there are other things. There's maritime. You want to do gunboat diplomacy. You can um, build ships. Some of these guys are like the Quaker shipbuilders. Um, there are um, a number of, uh, there's suffrage, um, manumission, so uh, there are a number of things that you can do abilities, but it's not just the abilities. Once you syndicate, um, you can, under certain circumstances, if the time is right for this idea, for Torqueville's idea, then you can install it into one of the two splays. And I've got, um, so this is like international law. And uh, I've already installed a few of them in here. Let's just say that it goes into the general will. Did you install this from setup? Or no, this is not this set is up. This is only example. This is only for example. You start yeah. with them empty. So they start like this. And then yes. over the time things can end up here. Over time, thank you for that clarification. Um, and once you install it, it's either the general will or the bill of rights. So uh, if you have law of the land, it's generally one of two categories. Either it's a, a fundamental principle of law, which is a bill of rights that's installed into a constitution and not subject to the vote, or it's something that a general will, um, it's something that uh, has to be voted upon. Um, and um, so these two splays have somewhat different characteristics. I have John Locke shown here and um, Rousseau, the two kind of competing enlightenment philosophers. And so their ideas on government um, are sort of reflected here. A, um, I'll just mention as an aside that the central thesis of this game is that um, it takes place during the Enlightenment and Enlightenment ideas were the very first to um, suggest that there are natural laws that not just um, Newton's ideas of uh, natural laws that govern the fall of an apple to the earth or the uh, motion of the moon around earth. There are also natural laws concerning um, conscious or civilized sentient beings in a society and that these laws are established by nature and not by man so that um, when they came up with these laws that are universal, um, the first Enlightenment theorist um, said, yes, uh, man by his nature has, uh, uh, will thrive best in these conditions. And then comes 
uh, they don't even think about uh, slaves or, or they don't dare to talk about slaves, but eventually followers draw obvious conclusions. And these followers could either be um, enlightenment activists, um, especially philanthropists in the game, or they could be enlightenment-inspired um, religious figures. And these religious figures were never mainstream, uh, at least not at first, uh, because mainstream had long established this particular hierarchy, um, especially in the Islamic world, uh, with um, the unfortunates at the bottom, and um, but there were fringe religions, um, evangelicals, um, that uh, sort of said, no, just because you're the Pope or the Sultan or, or the Caliph or whatever, doesn't mean that what you're saying is right. And um, they were able to challenge the, the established hierarchy. And um, their influence through petitions to Parliament, the third player, were um, very instrumental in gradually changing um, policy. Uh, you <laughs> England at the time uh, had, was one of the major players in the slave trade. Um, English citizens, English um, commercial agents, English politicians um, in, the, in India and, uh, well, uh, in the Chinese trade. Uh, very heavily invested in slaves and slavery, so for, for to suggest that this should be closed down was a very radical and uh, controversial thing, so it, it's a real fight. And um, the fight is going to be um, through syndication of abolitionist groups with their various ideas and different methods of freeing the slaves, and in display um, international law, um, which they were able to pressure other Western nations to abolish their slaves, and also to bring pressure also even on the Eastern world, which is uh, much slower in their abolitionism. So, um, yeah, you can, shifting downward generates money, if you shift into debt, that also generates money, but it's very hard to recover from. And um, I mentioned the important elements of the game. I'll also mention anarchy here. In general, the players will have a um, victory pile, more or less. And this victory pile will consist not only of anarchy discs, the idea here is that you want, anarchy's bad, okay, I consider anarchy, I'm not an anarchist, despite what some people uh, might have said, or what you might have read on the net or something, um, but um, anarchy I consider to be bad, so every anarchy that's on the map is bad, so if you can, if it, if during these revolutions or struggle to uh, modernity or through slave revolts you get anarchy, it's good to try to get it back to your victory pile. So everyone starts, um, at least in the three-player game, there's also a two-player game, or well, I'm solitaire, everyone starts with six anarchy victory points, but through their actions they may start putting the Ottomans into anarchy or maybe um, China into anarchy, um, and this is bad, you should try to get it back. That's China, right? Oh, yes, this is India, India. and this is... Yeah, um, exactly. So, um, you also have these hate groups. These are chits here, um, here's an example. The Ku Klux Klan. This is a... Uh, famous example. A famous example in... Uh, and it says in America there. Yeah, know this is yes, know where it belongs, and um, this uh, has um, if you are able to stop this hate group, um, which may occur as as slaves get liberated, they they may be fighting and enslaving them again or killing them off, but if you can stop the clan through legislation or other means, say the philanthropists manage to do that, they will put them here and they will 
also have another victory point. You get a victory point at the end for any of these bad things that you've managed to suppress. If there is a revolution, at least in the advanced game, you get to flip the 13 colonies side to the United States of America side, and um, it could modernize still as a British colony, um, or it could become, um, or it could become a free enterprise republic or something else like that. There are lots of possibilities on the road to modernity. And all different countries have the possibility to modernize too. Yes. This, this for instance, is um, Tokugawa, Japan, and um, during the Meiji revolts, which are around the 1860s, I think, it became a much more, I would say, modern um, state and um, uh, with uh, substantial uh, liberation of the serfs. Still, still a way for instance, they modernize. Ottomans was kind of a tricky one for me, but they modernize into the Soviet Union. So you have the Russian Revolution. That's about one of the last things in the game. And the extended version goes to 1917, the Russian Revolution. So you get figures like Karl Marx. Uh, is also considered to be an Enlightenment thinker and um, has his own brand of freedom because in the, in the game that I prefer the most, which is the cooperative competitive game, the players all cooperate. They're all tr struggling in their own way with their own asymmetrical abilities to liberate the world. Um, they struggle together. They struggle together with their individual. With their indivi they've got sort of individual goals, but um, none of them wins unless they all win. The, the, the British player wants to get rid of these um, blood products, for instance. He wants to clear all the shipping lanes. And um, shipbuilding, uh, we'll put here, say uh, he'll be fighting the Barbary pirates here in the uh, Mediterranean, and maybe he's in, made this into a warship, so he's got British Marines on board. So he'll fight to um, uh, maybe get rid of this particular um, piracy, um, piracy and um, thus collect more points that way. The um, philanthropist, is trying to lower the the green player is trying to lower the barriers in the world and these hate groups are considered barriers um, but the evangelicals are trying to liberate the slaves themselves and um, all of the each of these black squares on the map are are slaves there's quite a few here in china uh, and uh, each time you put a meeple on, this is a freedman. So especially player white will want to convert as many of these as possible into free citizens. They're also literate, by the way, because um, player white, these brand of evangelicals at least advocate literacy. But if they're liberated by someone else, if they're liberated by someone else to help player white in a cooperative game, then they'll be their brand of politics. And um, now if you're doing a cooperative game, pure cooperative game, um, you just try to meet these goals and free the world. And if you screw up, um, it could be, for instance, that um, Mm. The elephants may be in an area that you're trying to liberate, things go bad, um, anarchy starts to accumulate, and um, you have to roll, a, there is dice in this game, and you roll a number of dice equal to the amount of descent. There are little squares here for dissenters, um, but you actually rolled a number of dice equal to the number of slaves um, 
that are um, still extant in this area and the hate groups present here will say um, which freedmen get killed off. And I'll do a little example here. It looks like there's uh, three slaves. So I'm going to roll three dice. This is not actually accurate, but um, it's close enough. So I did a one, two, three. So I would look on these little hate groups and say, oh, uh, the Boxer, the Boxer Rebellion in China killed off a, a white freedman, a Christian. The Boxers didn't like Christians, so they killed one off. It's possible that he would go into a dissenter here. Um, the two would kill off another one, actually, because there's one, two. So by off. the boxers. Yeah, by the same by, by the boxers. But the three looks like um, it killed off a British uh, voter. Um, and this is the Manchu Inquisitions um, didn't like these guys. So it looks like China, by this role, um, would be ripe for revolution. And a revolution for China might come out. Um, because most of the dissenters are white, it would be a white side revolution. Let's see. Can you find that? Is this it? Yeah, King China. Yeah. So we have a, a choice between Taipan Rebellion or the Xinhai Revolution. So each of these cards represents each of these cards. There's one revolution potential for each of the map cards. That's how we find it. And um, the revolution can succeed or fail. <laughs> you want the revolution to succeed. And if it's generating too much anarchy, this anarchy is going to spill out as refugees. And they'll start flocking to um, adjacent areas. And maybe those will get, go into revolt. If you can have the whole world um, descend into pogroms, holocaust, and... And um, I'm, I think I'm just about done. The, there's also underground railroads in the game. Well, there's, it, there's a lot of elements to it. I'll mention just one more thing, though. The, I said that you could syndicate things by installing from your, um, from your finance board. And we should say, <clears throat> if you syndicate something, the, um, the market is restocked yes from the collapse it down and there's new cards new ideas new right here and in, in, in new heroes coming in and in traditional packs fashion these are the cheapest and they get more and more expensive um, these are probably these more expensive ones are probably out of reach but you can see them coming and try to plan ahead for them the um, the way, at least in the advanced game, that you are able to what's called globalize these cards into the display, make them in part of international law. And the way you can see if the time is right is by looking at the icons in the corner. And um, we have what are called freedom pairs here. Here we have in the general will under Rousseau, you have um, an example of candle, candle. I don't know if you can see these icons, but it's a candle uh, signifying enlightenment ideas. These cards are card number five and 64 there. Yes, five and 64. Um, there's only four icons in general. You can see them here. They're either black or red. The two black ones are very fundamental philosophical ideas. There's either a comet representing a supernatural basis for um, the immorality of slavery, or the candle, which means the natural um, basis for the immorality of slavery. So this, uh, some of these guys believe that slavery is bad because God said so, and others believe it's bad because um, that's the nature of humans in, in, in the way they evolved. So those are the two black ones. 
And um, here we have candle, candle. That means any super enlightenment ideas um, that also say candle, candle, which I don't happen to see any in the moment. But um, so if there were any of these, then their time, uh, they'd, you'd be able to install more into the display because they are viable. They are, their, I, their idea is um, um, manifested or sanctioned by the law, international law so far. And when you said, I don't see any at the moment, you were looking at both icons on each card. That's exactly so. So here, for example, on this card number, it's, let's say two there. Yes. You have Comet, Comet, but you were looking for Candle, Candle. But we only have Candle, Comet down there, for example, and uh, Candle, Lock over there. Yes. So this comment comment this is uh, jesuit re reductions and a picture of the um uh, south american indian who um who harbored and protected the jesuits and uh, led the fight against slavery there but he would not be able to go into international law because there's no comets next to each other there's also a candle comet here so actually candle comets uh could such as this one, Charles Darwin, his, uh, his ideas could actually be added to the general will. And we have unlock and comet. So um, the other, the red icons are feather. Feather represents, um, this is activism, political activism on the so-called left wing side. Left wing believes freedom should, uh, intellectual freedom, such as freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, um, freedom of, um, uh, of, to, of dissent. Uh, all these are considered to be left wing freedoms. The right wing, free, uh, which is unlock, these are more economic freedoms, uh, freedom to profit by your own efforts, freedom to marry who you want, freedom to um, quit and um, not be born to be a um, candle maker or, a, or till the fields, as in hereditary serfdom, something that was only abolished in China, uh, de facto abolished at least, only within my life, not only in my lifetime, only within the last like 10 years or so. So um, the, uh, these represent different sorts of freedoms. And so this leads into the competitive part of the game. If the players actually do succeed by some miracle, cooperate enough. As I see it, you do by, you take the sum of all your points and you need to get above certain thresholds. Yes, um, and you have to have a certain threshold uh, for each of these parameters, the, the pirates, the freedmen, and the barriers. And uh, if you do get above that, now you look at the barriers that are left to see if they're left, ref, um, left wing or right wing, and which, which revolutions went either left or right, and the players... Um, uh, have more, the evangelicals prefer right wing, the parliamentarians prefer left wings, the philanthropists prefer no wings, and so that, so you have a, a end game struggle over the particular variety of freedom that the world is left with to see who's the winner, and then all the dirty stuff comes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well this is before we go into to a short comment on that, so I just wanted to say that you said the left and right revolutions. The revolutions has a back side and a front side. And on the front side there is red, because it's left wing or, or back side, whatever. And it's white on the other side. Yeah, for the right wing. And, and that's something you choose? or it's um, it, it depends really on, uh, on the number of dissenters yeah. um, that are there, which way it's going to go. But you can, 
um, do what's called a counter revolution. Once the revolution's going one way, it's going to be in the market and going down. It's, it'll, it may take a while for it to resolve. And very often, um, players will say, yeah, it's, um, let's go to the other, other side because I, I really want the world to be more left wing. But it could be that the left wing uh, has less chance of success because it too has to be viable. Its ideas, um, icons, freedom pairs have to be viable in international law for this revolution to actually um, succeed. So if you're going to be selfish um, and looking towards the competitive game and cause a, uh, a sure thing revolution to become a very chancy thing and then it fails and the world goes to hell, um, then um, you're not, uh, you have to bring all the beer next time you play or something. I, I don't know, but uh, this is... Yeah. This was the uh, biggest design challenge in the game, I think. There's a lot of design challenges, but trying to make a cooperative then competitive game work and trying to make that go. This is, uh, this, this is uh, chancy. There'll be players who want to play the pure competitive game or the pure cooperative game, for sure. Um, and you can do that. Uh, the rules, yeah, the rules. Uh, the rules are, are very. Um, they contain a lot of, of uh, variants to play this game on, and um, it is uh, two two books of forty pages each. So there's a lot of material in here, and lots of way to play the game as you want it. And fortunately, so because I think this co cooperative than competitive game, um, it. It is a challenge for your playgroup to, to really uh, do this in a, in a way that's, that works. But it's also an interesting challenge, I think, because if you, if you manage, you, you will not um, be able to complete, completely ignore the fact that as the turns go by, you soon will start competing, uh, or you know you will at some point. And the closer you get to that point, and if you're looking good and you're probably going to make this, and uh, then knives will start appearing. Yes, knives start appearing. And uh, it's in a way uh, an interesting simulation of, of what's actually what's going on. So if you're if you're playing on the brink of failing, people tend to really cooperate. But when you start feeling right, this is good. We're gonna free the world. And uh, now I want this to be my world. No, I want this to be my world. Uh, hello, stop it. Uh, and then. Uh, it definitely uh, generates interesting gameplay and things that you don't see in many games. And I think uh, experiences that you will, uh, if you if you appreciate them, you will really like it in, in this game, for sure. Thank you, Jan. So that's Pax Emancipation. The standard game is from 1776 to about 1840 or 1850 or so. Um, there's also a game that goes to 1917, 1865, 1917. Uh, it um, plays... Um, you have to learn it. It's a steep learning curve, but um, it can play in two hours. Um, so if the players know what they're doing. And um, as I say, it's got a lot of experimental elements to it, but um, I hope you will try it and enjoy this game. Thank you.